Welcome to Real Wealth, Real Health, the show that empowers you with insights, information, and inspiration to achieve your version of financial wellness. Learn how to balance living a full life today with planning for the future. This podcast is brought to you by Alpha Investing, a real estate-centric private capital network that provides exclusive investment opportunities to its members. And now, here are your hosts, Ada Pia Dorico and Daniel Coca. Jeff, thanks so much for joining us on the podcast. Thank you. I'm happy to be here. So when we had our pre-call, I remember thinking there is no way that we're going to be able to keep this to under an hour because you have such a rich story that really, in my mind, speaks to these threads of fate and faith and a lot of hard work in achieving everything that you've achieved in your life and your career. And today, you're the assistant dean at UCLA Anderson, but let's start from the beginning of how you got to where you are today and, you know, maybe even unexpectedly. Well, it's totally unexpectedly. And first of all, I have a long story because I'm old. So, and that's an interesting thing also, because I'm going to be 70 in February and I don't feel old. I actually think my best years are ahead of me. And I used to think when I was, you know, a lot younger that 60 was ancient. And so now I guess, uh, 70s the new 40 i have no idea but as long as i have my health yeah. and you know my uh brains or lack thereof you know i will uh stay and and uh work at uh, ucla anderson and it is very ironic maybe i'll start where i graduated with a bachelor's degree from usc the arch rival of ucla anderson and because i got married when i was 19 and had a child just before i turned 21 when I graduated, I was, so I was in college, uh, I married a high school sweetheart, the whole story. And I had to go get a job because uh, I had a child. I, I was actually planning to go back to get a master's or stay, but I had to go work. So, and when we knew we were pregnant, I mean, I wasn't, but my wife was, I decided to go into accounting because I knew I could get a job in accounting. Mm-hmm. And so when I graduated from USC, Way back in 1973, Mm -hmm. I was fortunate to get offers from the big eight accounting firms. Now there's the big four, but the big eight accounting firms. And I selected Arthur Young because it had the culture that I thought met what I was looking for. It was the smallest of the big eight, and even though it was very large. And so I went to work, and I don't know if you know about public accounting, to get your C, I, I passed the CPA exam. It's funny, I wasn't the best student, but I studied with a gentleman named Dennis Dubin, and he actually won the gold medal for the United States as the best paper. And I barely passed, <laughs> uh, but I did pass the first time, which is which was good in itself. But worked at Arthur Young, I hated it, but I stayed three years uh, and got my CPA certificate and went on and started a tax preparation firm, just me, and you know, did some accounting for smaller businesses. And then the whole thread here that I want to get across is luck and timing has a lot to do with everything. I was, uh, I was born and raised in Southern California. And for those who know California, there's a big park near Century City called Rancho Park. And I would play tennis there. And I hooked up with a gentleman who was older than I was. And uh, we hit it off and we were playing tennis every week for several weeks. And you know, he learned what I did and he says, you know, Jeff, I like you. I'm going to change your life. Wow. And I said, you are? He says, yeah, here's my card. Come to my office tomorrow. And I guarantee you by the end of the day, you will be a different person. So I had no idea what this guy did. I showed up at the business. I knew right away that this was going to be a unique day. If you know anything about entertainment, the door name on the door was creative artists and creative artists was the hottest, biggest talent agent for sports stars, singers, actors, everybody who was anybody in, in, in the, in the entertainment field. And he came out and and his name was Bob Goldman. And he took me to the corner office and said, here's my boss. Uh, this is Michael Ovitz. And I don't know if you know, Michael Ovitz, you may be too young, but Michael Ovitz was the founder of creative artists. And 
he caused headlines. You can look this up on the internet. He left, years later, he left creative artists and went to Disney when Michael Eisner was the CEO. And I think he lasted six months and was uh, let go and got a $200 million severance package wow. that made, made headlines all over the world. But because I picked up creative artists as a tax client, mm-hmm. I, my little firm grew to 30 CPAs in three years. And I was the only partner. And then, again, luck and timing, I get a call wanting to know if I want to sell my accounting firm. And the firm that called <laughs> was Arthur Young. And Arthur Young didn't do acquisitions. And it was very, very unusual. And the reason they wanted is they had, they were big in entertainment. They did Warner Brothers and Paramount and Lorimar and all the big studios and the TV stations and stuff. And they wanted creative artists as a client and they could never break into it. So they bought my firm for that client, actually. Wow. Um, I, I remember my, I had two children by then. I'm in my late 20s, and my son, who was very young, came to the office on a Friday, and it said, Jeffrey Shinerock and Accountancy Corp. And on Monday, the door said Arthur Young, and he started crying, uh, saying, what happened to our name? Who stole our name? And I said, no, no, this is good. We're going to get a Mercedes. We're going to Europe. This is good. (laughs) And I tried to explain to him what an acquisition meant. And Arthur Young did something very unique then that that changed, again, my career in my life. They, f- accounting firms had a tax, a tax group, an auditing group, and a consulting group. Mm-hmm. They formed a fourth group, and they called it the Entrepreneurial Services Group, or ESG. And they asked me to run that and set it up. And, and I did. It was like the small business department. And they did, and I had a five-year earnout, meaning I got a price when they acquired, but if I hit certain milestones, I would get more money. And I stayed six years as a partner, and I hit milestones every year. Yeah. And so I got a lot more than the original purchase price in this earnout. Okay. And I was on the management committee, but while I was at Arthur Young, me and two other partners came up with a real crazy idea that no one had done at the time, that put me on a trajectory. Tra- tra- a direction that again changed. I, we came up with an idea called the Entrepreneur of the Year. Today, it's the Ernst & Young Entrepreneur of the Year Award. It's mm-hmm. worldwide. I started that, I think it's close to 40 years ago or 38 years ago. And one of the judges the first year in Los Angeles was a gentleman by the name of Al Osborne, and he was a senior associate dean at UCLA Anderson. And so he followed my career. Being on the management committee of Arthur Young, I knew a merger with Ernst & Winnie was coming, and I didn't want to be part of it. My earnout was over. Mm -hmm. And I went to go work for one of my clients, which was fairly controversial. I'll say some things here so you don't think I'm bad. I am, this may come across, this sounds like it's anti-Semitic, but I am Jewish. So I went to go work for three crazy Israelis. Okay, they they came to me and they needed a professional front man, basically. And they had a company at the time called Cal Apco. And I worked with them. Uh, a long story there, which I won't go into of how I picked them up as a, uh, as a client initially. But they had a very unusual business that they, th- these three people would make 20 million one year and then lose 5 million the next. And it was, they were in a commodity business and they sold what's called DRAM for computers. Mm. So they asked me to help negotiate the purchase of a name because they wanted to get into a product business. Make a long, long story. We purchased a name called Packard Bell. And Packard Bell was owned by Teledyne at the time. They asked for $10 million, I offered 10000 And after several months of negotiating, negotiating we purchased the name for 90000 I learned a valuable lesson on what could, you know, what's in a name. Packard Bell, if you're from the West Coast, your parents and grandparents probably had a Packard Bell electronic. Actually, in the Smithsonian Space uh, Space Museum, the first computer for the space program is a Packard Bell computer. Packard Bell went from zero to seven billion in revenue in six years. And I was the vice chairman of finance and strategic planning. And that was another being in the right place at the right time. I set up operations all over the world, never done it before. And 
I'll, you know, I'm leaving out a lot of stuff, but everything that could go wrong went wrong at Packer Bell, and I learned by just doing it. And in 19, uh, I'll give you an idea of what could go wrong. So basically, okay. we never made profits. And in 1994, there was a big earthquake in, in Southern California, the Northridge quake, and Packer Bell literally was totally destroyed. The building collapsed. Thank God everybody was at a break because we were running 24 hours a day. Mm -hmm. But the, the building collapsed and all the pipes broke, water pipes. We didn't have money for earthquake insurance, so we didn't have any. Luck oh, and wow. timing again, we had unlimited water damage coverage. And because everything was underwater because the pipes broke, we ended up negotiating the largest settlement ever with Lloyds of London. Took took three years. We also received the largest federal disaster loan until Katrina. And, you know, we were literally bankrupt. And then people really, I mean, Intel, Microsoft, all the big technology companies, because Packer Bell was so big, we were their largest customers. They came and supported us tremendously because we were literally, we had no inventory. Everything was destroyed. Mm -hmm. So everybody offered us additional credit, even though we had lousy financials. A few people tried to gouge us and we remembered that when we got sure. back on our feet and stopped yeah. doing business with them wow. but the story continues as Packard Bell we were in the negotiations in 19, 1995-96 uh, to sell the company mm -hmm. and because oh and we attempted to go public in 1992 and it failed so literally we were almost bankrupt then also, because and everybody knew our financials, so everybody tried to kill us. IBM, Apple, Compact, HP, everybody. So uh, can I just ask a quick question? So they tried to kill you in 92, but then they, they helped you, or some of them did. Not our competitors, the suppliers. Got it. The competitors saw our financials, and this was their chance, because we, at the time, believe it or not, we were the largest personal computer company in the world. Came I out of believe nowhere. it. I was going to ask. Out of nowhere. Yeah. yeah. How many people were employed? When I when I left that. when I left seven thousand, okay. uh, and we were worldwide and we were in like twenty two countries. But what happened was because we didn't go public, it failed. We were fortunate and we picked up money from a French company called Group Bull, and then another minority investment from NEC of Japan. So if you can think about this, we had the French. We had the Japanese, and we had three Israelis. And my job was to coordinate the culture, wow. which, was, which was impossible. <laughs> but we did it. And because NEC came on board, mm -hmm. uh, they had the NEC, if you're a golfer, NEC World Series of Golf. And I got to go and play golf with all the pros, which yeah. was quite an experience. I also got to go to all the Super Bowls. The, the suppliers would wine and dine us. Then... An unfortunate incident happened in 1996, the day before the Super Bowl in Arizona. I was in a bad accident and I broke my back. And again, we won't delve into all that, but when we, I took uh, the air ambulance from Arizona back to Los Angeles, they did an MRI and they said that uh, I shattered a few vertebrae and I probably would never walk again. At that time, my wife of 26 years, mm -hmm left when I'm in the hospital. She basically said she couldn't handle this and she was leaving. And that was a pretty dark time. So I didn't know if I was going to walk again. I'm in the middle of negotiating the sale to two or two offers, one from Sun Microsystem, all stock, and one from NEC, all cash. Yeah. And I stayed until the, the sale was completed, June 30th, 1996, and started to recover. And because of Packard Bell and the, our information was public in an S1, I'm trying to learn to walk again. I, I actually tried to resign from Packard Bell, but the three owners made it very lucrative for me to stay and finish the negotiation. So I did. From I get the a hospital. call. From, from the, the hospital. hospital. The sale was, yeah, the negotiations were at the hospital. We, that's when I met another, another luck. Our attorney was the law firm of Wilson Sonsini, Goodrich and Rosati. And if you're in technology, you know who that is. And Larry Sonsini himself was our attorney. So he became a very dear friend and, you know, helped us through the whole sales process. But what happened was I'm recovering <laughs> and I get a call from a gentleman 
asking if I was the Jeff Scheinrock that raised all the money for Packard Bell. Mm -hmm. And I said, yeah. And he goes, I want to hire you. I go, you don't even know me. And he goes, I don't care. I need to raise a billion dollars for an aerospace company. And if you could, I saw the S1. If you can raise money for that pile of shit, you can raise money for anybody. <laughs> So I said, look, I'm in California. I can't walk. He says, look, I'm going to send a young lady down there. Her name is Marion Joe. She's right out of college. Uh, she'll be like your gopher. She'll be your right-hand person. We'll open an LA office. We can do it from your house. But I need to raise this money. I decided to join them. And it was very interesting. Kistler Aerospace was run by all the ex-NASA people who retired who ran the Apollo program. So the Tom Hanks movie, all that, all the people that were, were shown in that movie were executives. And I learned the aerospace very quickly. We were having, a, we were having trouble raising the money and we were had a board meeting and I was asking one of the executives, his name was Dan Brennenstein, who was the commander of the space shuttle three times, what was your, what's the most interesting flight? And he says, the most interesting flight was when I flew to the space station and I took uh, a member of the royal family of Saudi Arabia, Prince Sultan of Saudi Arabia. And I, I couldn't make this stuff up. So I, I, there was the aha moment for Kistler. I, I'm listening and I said, can I ask a stupid question? And we have a very, very, a great board with very big executives, people's names you, you wouldn't recognize. And they go, yeah, you can ask a question. I said, did anybody ask the prince? if he'd invest right. and it was dead silence <laughs> right? and it was everybody said what a great idea so we had Dan Grant and Brennan Stein call Prince Sultan the next day in Saudi Arabia six weeks later roughly we were Dan and I were in Riyadh now what's interesting there it comes mm -hmm. back and I don't want to get into religion and all this stuff but back then and maybe even now if you were Jewish you could not go into Saudi Arabia Okay. So on the form, you had to say religion. And everyone was saying, don't put Jewish, don't put Jewish, don't do it, don't do it. But I was the chief negotiator, so I put Jewish. I said, I'm not religious, by the way. I'm, mm -hmm. not, I'm, not, I'm not religious at all. But I'm not going to lie about my religion. Yeah. And when we landed in Saudi Arabia, I, I, we got the invitation, and I'm on a Saudi airplane and we, from London, and we, we land in Riyadh, and we go past the main terminal, and all these soldiers come in and they they yelled Jeff Scheinrock and I'm going, Oh my god, they're gonna kill me, right? You know. <laughs> they took me out in the royal terminal. I never went through customs because we were a guest oh. of the royal family. My passport was never stamped. Fast forward in well, I won't go into some of the stories that were said, but fast forward we I the next day I'm doing a presentation in front of all these people in Saudi Arabia. And I go to slide one, Kistler Aerospace, slide two, we're looking to raise, you know, I think it was $400 million. And the prince stops me on slide two and says, look, and he brings Dan up and he goes, he puts his arm around him. He says, look, I put my life in his hands. And he went around the table. You'll invest 25 million. You'll invest 25 million. And these are all the biggest executives that ran companies in Saudi Arabia. Can you imagine in two slides, I raised close to $400 million. You're am, I, am I good or am I good or what? <laughs> and then the next day, I'm only there overnight. The next day, he yeah, he goes, "You're not going back to the United States with Dan." And I go, "Okay, here it comes. Now they're going to kill me." Right. <laughs> and he goes, "I'm going to send you to another country to meet my best friend." And I go, "Who's your best friend?" Sultan of Brunei. Okay. So I flew to Brunei. <laughs> another twenty-five million the next day. So it was quite an experience in three or four days. You know, we raised close to 400. We ended up raising the billion. Right. Uh, 300 from Northrop Corporation in in-kind money, but 700 million in cash. And I left after seven months of working there and re continued to recover. That's when another piece of luck came. So hold on. Is that a record? Like... Well, it might be. I don't know. <laughs> but it was, it was really... It was really... By the way, Kistler ended up going bankrupt. Oh no! Yeah, uh, nothing, I was gone. Had nothing to do with me. <laughs> uh, we were way ahead of our time. We were literally like SpaceX right. in 1998. Right. If you, I mean, way back when. But I then continued to. I did shine, uh, a consulting firm, Shine Rock Advisory Group, and because of the Kistler experience, I get a call one night 
at my office. It's me and Marion. So Marion left when I left Kistler. Marion actually married one of our engineers uh, named Jason Andrews. This becomes a big story too. Mm. And I get a call. It's Marion and I. And this guy says, I'm Vance Kaufman. And I don't know who Vance Kaufman is. And he's chairman and CEO of Lockheed Martin, uh, which is pretty amazing. Okay. Mm. And he says, look, I was told to call you by Dan Golden. Now that name I knew. He was the administrator of NASA. And Dan said what you did for Kistler, and I'm about to hire Goldman Sachs. Uh, we're going to retire the space shuttle, and I need to hire somebody to help me with the business plan, the financing plan, the marketing plan. And if I send the Lockheed Martin jet, because they're in Bethesda, Maryland, for you, can you come talk to me tomorrow? I need to make a decision by Friday. So I said, can I put you on hold? <laughs> so I go, what are you? So Marion goes, go, go. I said, so I go, I can clear my calendar. So I flew to Bethesda on the Lockheed Martin jet, met with Vance Kaufman. And he says in his office, okay, I need a proposal from you now. I need you for one week, a month, for three years. You're going to be out at Skunk Works in Palmdale. And this is, you need to come up and help us figure out how we're going to finance the space, uh, the replacement for the space shuttle, because the government doesn't want to finance it. I said, can I answer, I, I said, I have two questions. He goes, yes. I said, can I give you my proposal in the morning? He says, mm -hmm. yes. And he goes, what's the second question? I said, can I use the jet to go back home? <laughs> <laughs> so I went back home on the Lockheed Martin jet. And then Mary and I are sitting there and she goes, I go, what should we bid? It's the two of us for a week a month. So wow. I said, what do you think? And three year contract. I said, what, 25,000 a month? She goes, you know, you're competing against Goldman Sachs. Why don't you say 50? Mm. So I call Vance Kaufman. It literally, as soon as I said 50,000 a month, he says, you're hired. Can you start tomorrow? Oh my when God. I hung up, Mary Ann goes, I should have said a hundred. <laughs> <laughs> So we, we actually, if you watch the Discovery Channel, the program was the X-33. That's the predecessor vehicle. Venture Star actually never happened because the technology was too advanced. But because of that, I got hired by NASA to be a special advisor, and I helped put together the RFP that's SpaceX one. Oh, my god! Talk gosh. about networking and being in the right place, right? Now, during all of this, Al Osborne's following my career. Mm -hmm. Remember Al Osborne from UCLA? Yeah. So he calls me one day when, again, luck and timing. I'm current. I, I'm leaving out a lot, but I fell into being asked to be a general partner and the chief investment officer at a fund of funds. I didn't even know what a fund of funds was. Mm -hmm. But this young lady, Erica Bushner, asked me, and I said yes. And when I joined her, we had thirty million under management, and within six months, we had a billion too. We picked up the New York State Common Retirement Fund, State of Pennsylvania, Northwest Mutual Life, a lot of yada, 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 big companies. And so I learned the venture business by doing due diligence as the chief investment officer on close to 100 funds. And we invested a little over a billion dollars in 67 funds. And I sat on 32 advisory boards. So I learned the venture business a, a unique way from the venture side out. Okay. Mm. Al's following my career. Our CFO happened to be an Anderson grad. His name's Brian Newton. So he introduced me to Al, reintroduced me to Al. And Al said, would you be a faculty advisor for the executive MBA program? I need somebody with international experience. What you did at Packer Bell, would you do this? So I said, I'll do it under one condition that I will, I want to teach. He goes, Jeff, Jeff, you have three strikes against you. I go, what are those? You went to USC. Of course. You don't have a master's and you don't publish and it could take 10 years. I said, fine, I, I can wait. I'm in my forties at this time. Okay. Mm -hmm. Fast forward. I do the faculty advisor role for two years and I get a call on a Thursday afternoon from Al Osborne. He says, you want to teach? I go, yeah. He says, I have a class for you. It's business plan development. Mm -hmm. uh, I said, okay. I said, when does it start? He goes, Monday. I go, whoa, 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 how am I supposed to prepare? And he goes, you're the entrepreneur, figure it out. And he hung up. So I called the professor whose class I took. His name was Bob Foster. And he gave me all of his slides. I used them with his name on it and everything and then adopted the class for me. And the rest has sort of been history. I, I've been at UCLA since 2006, one of my part-time. And then in 2010, I'm leaving some stuff out. I joined another company called Originate, which is a really cool company and stayed there for 
the 10 years I just left, I resigned from the board April 30th of this year and left as the uh, president and CFO in December. Mm -hmm. And I'm focused fully on UCLA now. But this UCLA journey is is sort of uh, unusual. I, I did well teaching these classes. And then they asked me about five years ago when I was part-time there to take over one of the master thesis programs called the business creation option. This is where the students wanted to came up with an idea and wanted to start their own business. When I took mm -hmm. it over, we had four teams of five students. We changed it. Ago, another piece of luck and timing I left out uh, while I was at UC, uh, UCLA. I wrote a book with one of my students. It's called The Agile Startup. And so I did publish, but it caused a lot of uproar because if you look at the book and you can go on Amazon and look at it, it's, it's 162 lessons of 200 words or less of everything I learned in business. And each page is a cartoon caricature and it's in four color. But I had a really, and so they go, this isn't an academic book. This is like a book for dummies. And, and, but it's been very successful. Sure. And I, when I went to publish it, I couldn't get a publisher. So remember I said I was in the fund of funds. One yeah. of the companies we invested in was a company called Foundry Ventures in Boulder, Colorado, founded by Brad Feld. Mm -hmm. Brad Feld is also the co-founder of Techstars. So Brad was published by Wiley Corporation, and he was very successful. So I called Brad, and I said, do you remember when we were the first institutional investor in Foundry One? And he goes, Jeff, I'll never forget it, because when you came in, then everybody else came in. Mm -hmm. Nobody wanted to be first. Mm -hmm. And he goes, what can I do for you? I said, well, it's funny you ask. Uh, can you go to Wiley and ask them if they'll publish my book? Mm -hmm. And within five days, I had a contract. Talk about networking. Yes. Also because of that, Brad and another person I know, uh, Michael Abrams, who I've invested with over the years. Michael was the, the senior VP in charge of innovation at Walt Disney Corporation, and they wanted to start an accelerator. Mm -hmm. And uh, Michael asked me also, David Min was running it also, and he was one of my prior students from Anderson. <laughs> and they asked me, should they hook up with Y Combinator or Techstars? And I told them what I knew about both. And make a long story, they hooked up with Techstars and it became the Walt Disney Techstar Accelerator. And they asked me to be a lead mentor. Mm. And I did that. And with the permission of Techstars and Disney, I took what I learned there and put it into the UCLA BCO program. So this is where networking and everything you know, yeah. goes around. So it's been very successful. We BCO is this year we'll have 60 teams, over 300 students, 51% raise money and launch. We've had a couple of big wins where they've raised over 100 million, but most of them are lifestyle businesses where they raise 500,000 to two or three million. And it's just been really great and a lot of fun. I, I love what I do. I mean, I'm, I'm making a difference. And this is, I mean, it's just been phenomenal. So based on the success there, they then asked me to take over the Applied Management Research Master Thesis Program for the full-time students. And then on July 10th of this year, they asked me to take over the Global Access Program for the fully employed MBAs and the Strategic Management Research Program for the executive MBAs and something called NUS Practicum with the National University of Singapore and UCLA. Mm -hmm. So now I have a really big job. It's one of the reasons I stepped away from Originate. But I'm running the largest program at UCLA Anderson. And this little boy from, well, I'm a big boy, so I'm over six feet tall, but you know, I'm running the master, they hate when I say this, I'm running the master thesis program, and I don't have a master's. Uh, yeah. But I have a lot of practical experience. So that's sort of my journey. I, I'm, I'm very fortunate, uh, and I've left a lot of stuff out, but it's just luck and timing, working hard. You know, look, I'm not the smartest guy in the world, but I, I do work hard. One of my students was Fark. Right. Fark is your partner. Your partner. And yeah. he, he asked me, and I have to be careful. I really don't invest. I've only invested in three of all these years, only three UCLA students' companies. And I put a small amount of money into one of your investments that did well, by the way. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. uh, that's a plug for them, everybody. <laughs> and, and, but, you know, I, I, I don't invest very often because I, you know, can you imagine I have 60 teams this year? They're all going to ask me to invest. Right. So, and, and I, I probably won't do a lot more venture investing at this point. I'm being a conservative CPA. I'm probably very aggressive when it comes to investing. And so, you know, 
I've only invested in one of your deals. I may or may not invest in others. Because of my age, I don't know, you know what new investments I want to make. But you know, I know you want to get into investment strategy and stuff at some point, but that's my story. Yeah. I'm very happy to be at UCLA Anderson. I hope to make uh, a difference there. It's my way of giving back by opening my network up to the students, which I have done. And no one helped me when I started, when I you know, got married at a young age. Actually, my parents said, you're on your own. We don't think you should get married. Back then, they had to sign for me. You had to be 21. And so I think I pushed myself partially because they said I wouldn't succeed. Now, I did get a divorce. I left that out. <laughs> wow. and, but good comes out of bad. And I, I, I can walk. I'm fully recovered. Right. That's I, I an important I, part of the story. Yeah, I left that out. I, I recovered. I, I have a very bad back and I've had several surgeries. But this is a mellow me, believe it or not. So one of the lessons, and I tell the students, is look, I, I did not have a balanced life. I'm actually closer to my children. My, yesterday, in fact, yesterday was my daughter's 49th birthday, if you can believe that. And I have four, excuse me, five grandchildren from 16 months up to 16 years. Mm. And, you know, I'm closer to the grandchildren than I was to my own children. And that's a bad thing. Right. And that's a sad thing. Right. Because I was, a, you know, working at Packer Bell as they were growing up. And oh, by the way, I left something else out. I also had 8 million frequent flyer miles <laughs> because, because I was running every two weeks around the world to Japan with NEC saying I need more money than to France, to Group Bull, yeah. and then all the suppliers. So I was almost George Clooney. If I would hit 10 million, I would have got a black card from American Airlines, but I have a platinum for life. <laughs> wow. I was going to um, say, does that get you like your own private jet if you no, have it, that it, many? It gives you, if you hit 10 million miles on an airline, you get a black card, which means you get first class everywhere for coach. Okay. Yeah. With a platinum, you get upgrades if there's a first class mm -hmm. seat. Mm -hmm. So it's come in handy. Mm -hmm. Oh, and by the way, in the divorce, my ex-wife got 4 million miles, half of it. She wanted miles? She Sorry. wanted half of it. Well, look, we, we had nothing when we got started. So we just split everything 50-50 down the middle. Goodness. But good yeah. comes out of bad. Always. I've been with Marlene, my uh, fiance of 20 years. Wow. She won't marry me because I'm a nut. But we're, you know, I'm, again, I'm, I'm very fortunate and, you know, been around a while. This whole thing with COVID is very disturbing. The whole thing with the protests, uh, mm -hmm. protests are fine. The violence is extremely disturbing. And I won't get into politics, even though I did touch religion. I, I think this is a really critical time. And I, I, it's hard for me to believe, I don't know if you even today, the market's way up again. I don't understand this with unemployment the way it is and everything, but I like it because I'm heavily invested. Right. And I, I just think it's, you know, in bad times, in times of crisis, is good times, a lot of people make a lot of money. Mm. And another plug for you and others in real estate, real estate's a safe investment. Mm -hmm. Over years, if you, you know, if you're buying good properties, you should do do well. Now, with COVID, with rents maybe not being paid and all that, it's a challenge, I'm sure, yeah. for a lot of properties. So yeah. people need to be careful. But I've always invested for the long term. And so if you're younger and you have a 10, 20, 30-year horizon, I think having a balanced portfolio, which includes real estate, maybe some venture. By the way, it, when I did the fund of funds, interesting, the largest pensions plans in the world, people who are really sophisticated, they allocate 10% of their money. So into what's called alternative investments. Yes. And that's venture, private equity, hedge funds. They also allocate into real estate and then they allocate into bonds and stocks and you know a variety of buckets. That's what an individual investor should do. Be diversified. And then, you know, I'm maybe because I'm diversified, I may not do as well if things really go well, but I'm also protected in a downside. Yeah. So yeah. That's my story. I probably took too long. I don't even look at the time, but no, that, that's uh, that's what it is. So, so there, top that. <laughs> I don't think I can. I don't think I can top that. And I didn't even want to, you know, interrupt you because I mean, the reason you know we wanted to have you on was to tell this amazing story. And I think behind it all are just an, an immense set of values that you have. And one of the things that you were actually touching on right now with like the investment stuff, but, and also COVID and, and throughout your story is 
uncertainty, right? Which right now we're in probably mm. the most uncertain times. But there's the short-term view, the medium-term view, and then the long-term view, and then the view of self. And what one has within themselves to overcome or live through, let's say, like uncertainty, because the, you, you mentioned a lot of times like luck and timing, but you probably left out all the times that were, you know, except for the, a couple of really big dark times, but there's a level of resilience in you as well. You know, what are some of your values and what have you learned through these times? Well, one of the things I left out, which is a not, a, not a good story, is when I had my accounting firm and my largest client, which was a car, car automotive dealership, didn't pay their bills, my, my invoices. Yep. And I had all these people work that I was responsible for, and I couldn't make payroll. And I couldn't get a line of credit because I was a new young CPA. Uh, I learned a very valuable lesson there. When If you wait until you need money to go ask a bank for money, you'll never get it. Mm. So I did when I was when I I did finally I, I I told I missed three payrolls and nobody quit, uh, nobody sued me, and then when I did finally get paid, I gave everybody a bonus and you know and and I had a very good year, so I went and got a bank line of credit. To this day, I still have that line of credit with Union Bank of California from the seventies, by the way, or eighties, and I've never used it, and I pay an unused line fee every year. I call it preventative banking, and God forbid of an emergency, I can always call upon it. So my values, I think, are always tell the truth. I also learned a valuable lesson when bad things happen and you, and you borrowed money or you have investors, you go to them and tell them right away. People hate surprises. If you tell the truth early, you can usually work through them, and that's one of the one of the things that made me successful at Packer Bell because we couldn't pay people on time. And I went to them, Intel, Microsoft, Seagate, uh, Western Digital, big companies, uh, Connor Peripherals, you know, Panasonic, NEC, uh, all these companies. And because I was always up front, and even though we paid late, we always paid. And I think that's why they helped us with the earthquake and, and, and things because we were always very honorable. I also learned another valuable lesson at Packer Bell that I left out. The, chair, the CEO is a famous guy here in LA. His name is Benny Allagem, and he owns the Beverly Hilton and the Waldorf at Wilshire and, and, and Santa Monica Boulevard. It's very valuable. Benny taught me a lot, and one of the things he taught me, he treated everybody with respect. So when we were dealing with the largest retailers, whether it be Best Buy or you know, uh, Costco or Walmart or any of the big, big retailers, most of them gone, CompUSA and you know, people like that are gone. But he would treat the buyers with a lot of respect. And so when we had hard times, they stuck with us, even though our competitors tried to kill us, saying, drop Packer Bell, go with us. So I, I learned always to you know, treat people with respect, treat people the way you want to be treated. Don't lie. Now, Marlene will tell you, my significant other, that I maybe embellish sometimes. I can't help myself. But I don't remember what I say, so I don't lie. And, and the, even in bad times. I mean, some of, the, some of the closest friends I have are people I fired. Cause, and they go, I don't know how you did that. You fired me, but I feel good. And, and they went on to you know, bigger and better things. The guy that wrote the book, Matt Sand, he is raising a Series B now. He has a company called 3DEO. He's raising a $30 million dollar series b and i introduced him to a lot of the vcs that invested now they didn't do it because i introduced them but it's again if you have a network and you you and you're and you take good referrals to people this is something very important too don't refer something that you don't believe in because that'll be the last referral you ever give if it's not of top quality so you know i i kept my network alive i learned to even Larry Sonsini, to this day, we're very close friends, and it's been years, okay? And he's a reference for me. The guy, my reference, Arvind Sidani, who was treasurer of Intel, who went on to be president of Intel Capital, is a reference for me. I mean, these are, if you throw a name out, assume someone's going to call. And if, you, if, if they don't speak well of you, you're screwed, okay? So, and, and when you're negotiating, don't bluff if you don't have a backup. I learned all this stuff over the years. But, you know, you be true to yourself. I mean, look, I, I don't need to work. I'm not rich by any means, but I'm comfortable. And 
I work because I, I, I'm in a position now where I can, I'm doing what I love. And that's a great position to be in. So if I was younger, I would, my, the goal would be always keep some cash on the side in case of an emergency and be diversified and try to get to a place where you can work with people you want to work with, not with people you have to work with, uh, which I did. I left out one job in between that I actually hated and I quit. And it was very distressful at the time. To work at a place that you don't enjoy and you work with people you don't respect is really bad. And so if you're fortunate enough to plan, I would highly recommend uh, that you do that. And, you know, don't, don't leverage yourself too much too early because things happen. Who knew we were going to have a pandemic? Does that, does that answer? I don't know if I even answer. I see I, I ramble. It's, it's, old, it's a senior moment. <laughs> no, you're good. You're good. <laughs> Uh, and so, Jeff, I, I feel like for me, as I hear you talk about your story and you talk a lot about, you know, good luck, good timing, what I'm actually hearing is more, you know, putting yourself in the right position, building the right relationships, you know, being able to extract value from your network. You know, in this current, you know, situation we're in in the world, what's your advice? You know, whether you're younger or older, further in your career, how do you put yourself in the right position to find all these opportunities? I think it's hard. It's work. Don't be lazy. Over the years, going all the way back to my own accounting firm and then Arthur Young and coming forward, I, to this day, still reach out to, say, the top 50 of my contacts on a quarterly basis just to say hi, you know, whether it's email or a voicemail, just to, you know, say, hey, I'm thinking of you. Uh, you never know when you can, you need a favor. And you never know, and always never ask, oh, this is really key. Never ask for something for nothing. Always offer something. Because people don't like people who try to take advantage of them. There are takers and there are givers. I would try to, if you can, if you can afford to do this and stuff, be a giver. And then when you do need to, uh, a favor, you'll be shocked at how many people will support you. So keep, it's work to keep your network alive. You, Believe it or not, I mean, everything's online now at UCLA. This is a really unusual time. We're not having any classes on campus this fall, which starts very shortly. Zero. Everything's online. And here is the amazing thing. And the students are upset, and they, you know, because part of the experience is being together on campus and all this. But because of these programs I run at UCLA, people need to do a lot of research, secondary and primary research. We have found that it is easier now, even though they're not traveling and going out. People are stuck at home. People are bored. People will take the time to talk to you. Reach out. Ask how people are doing. And then ask if you need a favor or ask what you can do for them. People will take the time to talk to you. Just be, you know, but... Be genuine. I mean, don't do this because I'm saying to do it. Do it because you want to do it. And and that's what I'm giving, I, I think, the students. I mean, I'm trying to – I actually tell them about the divorce and having a quality of life and to, to try to have a balanced life. But I didn't, and it cost me. I mean, unfortunately, everything works out. And as I said, good comes from bad. But, you know, I'm I'm very, very fortunate, and, you know, my kids, you know, I can't replace that time when I didn't go to the baseball games uh, for my son or the, you know, classes for my daughter. I tried to go to the, my grandkids stuff. Well, not in COVID, but I actually flew to, my son has, my son and daughter-in-law are in Texas and I have two granddaughters there and I actually flew to their ballet recital and surprised them. I never did that for my kids. I mean, it was funny, in the middle of the recital, my youngest granddaughter stopped and said, that's my grandpa, he came from California. <laughs> While she was on stage? Yeah. <laughs> so that, what's that worth? Right. I mean, you know, yeah. so things like that. I don't know if that answers your question, but that's, you know, it's work to keep a network. It's work, it, 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 you know, th things aren't free. Yeah, I think as we talk about building wealth and we think about building wealth, there are these questions around, you know, how do you actually do it? Do you show up to a, a job where you're a W-2 employee and just kind of go to work every day and you know, hope that things work out? Or do you, you know, take active steps to position yourself, you know, in a way that, 
you know, gives you these opportunities to, to take risks, right? And I think I read on your, your bio at UCLA, you talked a little bit about, and I'm summarizing here, but, you know, I wanted to work hard. I wanted to earn more. And so I took a risk on myself. And I think that's a question that a lot of the people in our network have is like, am I willing to do that? Right. And it's a really hard question to ask because everyone wants to think they're willing to take a risk on yourself. But when you weigh all the other things that come with that, sometimes it's, it's challenging. Right. You know, you have family, you have other obligations. Uh, you're not always willing to do it. And so I think your story is a great one for people who just want to think a little bit more about you know, their own journey and you know, the different opportunities that could be presented to them. Well, you hit on most of the things, believe it or not specifically with the fully employed and the executive MBAs, because they are a little older, they have families, they have careers. I, one of the classes I teach is venture initiation and entrepreneurship. And always in the first class, someone will say, when do I know it's time to take the leap? And I mean, you hit on some of the things. I said, let me just ask you these questions. Are you mar married? Yes or no. Do you have children? Yes or no. Do you have a mortgage? Yes or no. And then the hardest question of all, can you afford to live without getting a salary for 18 months? Depending how you answer that, answer that question is the way that I would answer you, do you take the risk? And, take the, and try to do it when you're, you're young, if you can. The younger you are, if you're able to answer those questions and be able to live. Now, why do I say 18 months? A lot of investors, if you're going to start a business, wants, want to see you put sweat equity in and don't want their money to necessarily go out into your pocket. And they want it to stay in the company. Now, some investors will actually sit with you and say, okay, what do you need to live? Because if you don't have the wherewithal, then you're not going to be paying attention to the business. You're going to be out trying to earn money somewhere else and not running the business. So, you, by the way, don't do a business part-time and take other people's money. You can do that if it's your family, maybe, and your own money. But, you know, if you're going to start a business, it's really hard. And it has to be a full-time focused effort. So I don't know if that answers your question, but I would say, you know, answer those, those questions and others. And depending on how you answer them, it's time to take that leap or not. Yeah, that's, it's really such great advice when you were saying this about the, the, the being young part, I think in, you know, in like media, the way uh, entrepreneurship is very romanced in media and we focus on like the big, big successes, there's not a lot of focus on the work and the grit and the resilience that goes into it. And also this idea of, you know, energy and like youth, but it's not really about that. Like you said, it's actually much more practical consideration that like I know when I was younger and I didn't have anything to lose so to speak or I didn't have a husband I didn't have a mortgage like I wouldn't even necessarily think about it in the same way that I might be thinking about it now so I think it's great advice because it brings it to a very practical level and it tempers you know, the, these, these dreams that are very easy to latch onto, but very hard to accomplish, especially if you're worried about your mortgage or your kids. I mean, you can't, you, I had that experience too, where I can't be creative. I can't focus because in the back of my mind, I don't feel stable. And it's, and you know, unless somebody is able to live in that state emotionally and psychologically, it's very challenging. Very challenging. Two, two other things I think I should point out. One is, if at all possible, make sure you have health insurance. Figure out a way, I mean, with what the government has now and all these things, I, you know, I'm fortunate because I'm at UCLA and we have a really good health plan. Thank you for, if you're in California, thank you for your tax dollars because we're a public university. But make sure you have health insurance, especially if you have a family, because you don't know, God forbid, when something's gonna happen. And the other thing is, if you're going to be asked to sit on a board of directors, be very careful. Make sure they have DNO, directors and officers, liability insurance. And rather than sit on a board, even though it sounds really good, go on a board of advisors. A board of directors can be sued. A board of advisors won't. And so just some things if you're, I mean, I would think a lot of people that might be your clients or potential clients are successful and had successes and might be asked. Just, you know, I, I've been sued a couple times in my life, and I don't sit on a public board anymore. I got sued twice, and I, I even though we had DNO insurance, 
I hired my own attorneys because the most important thing you have, this is the other, probably the biggest lesson, your self, your reputation and respect is more, people go, you know, do you want to be friends with your employees? I don't need to be friends with the people that I work with. What's mm -hmm. more important is it's that we have a mutual respect. And so I defended against these baseless lawsuits, even though I came out of pocket because the attorneys on the DNO insurance represent the company. And even though I was on the board, their first interest is the company. And then the cases got dismissed and they weren't, didn't have any merit, but people will sue people for, especially if you have, you know, some assets, people will can sue you for no reason and hope that you settle. So just be very careful. That's uh, probably right. preaching a little bit, but I think it's important. Um, it's great advice. Yeah. It's great yeah. advice. It's like, I, I know a lot of people that, like you said, it sounds good to be on a board of advisors, but it's actually a real responsibility um, yeah. that, that comes not at, not at a small cost. Board of advisors is safer than board of directors. Right. Okay. Right. Yes. One final question. And what does wealth mean to you? I think uh, that's a good question. I mean, they're all good questions. But again, I've done fine. I've saved. Uh, wealth means to me, I think one of the things that I said to you to give me the ability to, to do and work with people that I enjoy versus having to work with anybody just to live, having enough to where I can live comfortably. I've been, again, very fortunate. I've take I've set up trusts and things. And so my kids and grandkids have actually are taken care of. So I was able to do that. But again, I'm not so young. I mean, I'm going to, again, I can't really believe how old I'm going to be. But having enough assets and liquid assets to where I'll have less stress and, and be able to do things. I mean, I'm not extravagant. I worked hard to have zero debt other than a car lease, which I don't know why I have because I can't drive anywhere. But being fortunate to not have a lot of debt and, and, and uh, be able to live comfortably. Believe it or not, we... We, up until COVID, uh, Marlene and I, we, we work hard and we play hard. She also has a full-time job and is a very successful attorney. We would go on f four to six cruises a year. Yeah. Guess what? No cruising now. I don't even know if we want to go back. <laughs> so we have to figure out, you know, where we're going to travel and do things. It's a little scary right now. But yeah. I would also highly suggest, I don't do it, but do what I say, not what I do. Try to take uh, every day, uh, clear your head, take a walk just do something, you know, it's, uh, it's, I'm busy and I have, you know, because of UCLA and stuff, there's no shortage of things to do, but this is getting to me too. I mean, this lockdown and stuff, I'm sure it's affecting everybody. I can't even imagine if you have young children and you're homeschooling them. And I mean, I, I've been on, <laughs> I've been on uh, Zooms, I'm sure you have, and you're talking to somebody, all of a sudden a child comes flying through and <laughs> jumping on their lap or whatever. I mean, I can't even imagine yeah. what, what it's like. So, you know, try to make sure you take enough breaks and things. Yeah, that's great. That's great advice. That's great advice. Well, Jeff, thank you um, so much for taking some time to be on um, our podcast and tell your story and, and just really provide so much wisdom uh, and and it, it really is, it's meaningful because I think just to, to summarize, like one of the things that strikes me about you is this will, this wanting to give back from the, the, the wealth of your experience and you're so generous in everything that you do. There's so much generosity woven through your story and it really comes through. So really, really appreciate you. Very grateful. Well, thank you. That's very nice of you to say. I think one of the reasons I do it is... Look, no one really helped me when I started. It, it's hard if you don't have a mentor or somebody you can lean on. I mean, that guy, Bob Goldman, didn't take me under, I mean, didn't, if I didn't, hadn't met him, mm -hmm. I, I, it would be a totally different, I mean, I'm sure I would have done fine. He just accelerated it, I mean, so fast. And, you know, I'm indebted to him forever. I mean, why me? <laughs> maybe, <laughs> maybe because he beat me at tennis all the time. <laughs> <laughs> If that were the reason, that would actually be really funny. But I'm know. sure it's because he saw something in you that clearly a lot of other people have seen. And I think it comes down to that working hard and that you're the, the trust and the generosity and the genuineness that, that really you exude. Well, good luck with everything. Stay Thank safe, you. stay healthy, Thank stay you. sane. <laughs> and uh, if, uh, if I can help you in any way, let me know. We appreciate that so much. Thank you. Thanks, you're welcome. Jeff.
Thank you very much. Thanks for tuning in to Real Wealth, Real Health. We hope that you've enjoyed today's episode and found it both informative and insightful. We welcome all your questions and your feedback about today's episode. And especially, we welcome your questions about specific topics that you would like us to cover. So shoot us an email at podcast at alpha i.com. And if you have a moment, we really appreciate ratings and reviews as it helps us grow our online community and our interactions with you. And we'll also be linking to a number of relevant articles on topics that we might have touched on during our conversations. Some of them are broad, some of them are technical, but we're always aiming to provide information that helps you better understand the mechanics of building this healthy financial foundation, especially if you're looking to do this with real estate. 